morning, but I'll go ahead and kind of get started and before handing things over to our presenters today. Um, thanks for joining us for another webinar offered as part of ACRL's COVID-19 and Academic Librarianship webcast series. Our goal for these webinars is to bring our colleagues together to strategize ways to best meet the needs of the library community during this uncertain time. We have additional webinars planned for the coming weeks, so please check the ACRL website for those details. Also, please feel free to use the chat box to share other top topics that are percolating so we can respond with new webinars or resources. So feel free to share other ideas that you have, topics, areas of concern, and we're happy to see how we can best respond to that. Um, today's session is being recorded. We will email out the link to the recording shortly after the webcast. We will also post the, web, the recording online on the ACRL website. We will capture the webinar slides and the chat as part of the recording, so all of those resources will be shared. Today's webcast is quickly implementing accessibility tools. I'd like to thank our presenters, Rachel Fager and Lauren Wittick, for being with us today. Rachel is the Cataloging, cataloging and Metadata Librarian at St. Joseph's University. She's worked in higher education for over eight years. Lauren is an assistant professor and user experience and assessment librarian at Central Washington University. She has worked in academic libraries for about four years and has worked in higher education for over a decade. Lauren is passionate about user experience and finding ways to make our libraries resources accessible to all. Thanks again, Rachel and Lauren for being here today and please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, um, and thank you all for being here today with us. Welcome to our discussion, quickly implementing accessibility tools. I think this captures what we are all experiencing right now. We need to make changes and we need to do it quickly. Lauren and I were asked last week if we would be interested in facilitating an accessibility themed webinar. And we hadn't met, but we quickly came together across time zones with me on the West Coast and Lauren, with me on the East Coast and Lauren on the West Coast to share some of our knowledge, tools, and tips with you. So you can take the great work that you're doing now to serve your communities and make it more easily accessible to more of your community. So hello, my name is Rachel Fager. I am the Cataloging and Metadata Librarian at St. Joseph's University. I became aware of and interested in accessibility several years ago while learning some basics of the assistive technology provided at the community college where I was working. I've been a student in online classes at the graduate level and my interest in accessibility benefited me. To help me get through staring at a computer for my full-time job and then for several more hours each week for classes, I used some of the assistive technologies. I did a virtual poster session for ACRL DLS, distance learning section, last year with some of my insights from those experiences and I have linked to that poster on the slide. I keep working to learn more and using my insights and skills that I gain Though I'm still learning and practicing, I'm happy to share some tips with you and look forward to learning from you and getting your comments and suggestions as well. And my name is Lauren Wittick, and I'm the I'm an assistant professor in user experience and assessment librarian at Central Washington University. I've also provided a link to my ACRL poster, which includes the poster itself, as well as a text based version of the poster for use with a screen reader. While the one-shot sessions I teach at my library have been in-person, I've taught online credit-bearing courses as well as provided online embedded services to my liaison departments. I'll be sharing some tips and tools that have worked for me personally. Um, if you have any suggestions or questions, please feel free to share or ask us at the end of our presentation. So here's what we'll be talking about today. I'll start with some basic background information about individuals living with disabilities go over the main principles of universal design for learning. I'll share some free and low cost accessibility tools you can use for your instruction. And finally, Rachel will talk about creating accessible documents and PDFs. 
So here's a little bit of background information about why accessibility is so important, particularly now that institutions are moving to strictly online instruction. Uh, according to the CDC, one in four American adults live with a disability. In this instance, disability is not just limited to issues with mobility, cognition, and vision. It can also include challenges with self-care and independent living. Roughly 11% of undergraduate students report having a disability, according to the US Department of Education. In actuality, this percentage is most likely higher since not every student needs or wants to report their disability to receive an accommodation. And according to the latest stats collected by the National Center for Education Statistics, there are over 6.5 million students enrolled in at least one online course. Now that number has obviously completely ballooned due to COVID-19 restrictions. So using the raise your hand feature in the chat window, it should be on your right hand side. Um, how many of you are familiar with universal design or universal design for learning? If you wanna just raise your hand. We got a couple of people. Yeah, okay, so a handful of you are. Um, so how can we best meet the needs of our online students? This is where the idea of universal design for learning comes in. You may already be familiar with uh, this, the idea some of you indicated. While traditional design is more of a one size fits all approach where functionality for the majority of users is the goal and arrangements are reactively made for special needs as they crop up. Universal design, however, is the quote, design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation of specialized design. Um, some everyday examples include doors that automatically open when a person approaches, adjustable work desks, and large print signage. And so universal design for learning applies this concept to the creation and sharing of learning assets in your classroom. So the principles of UDL are pretty straightforward and many of you may already be implementing these ideas into your courses or one shot sessions. It's a design principle that seeks to reduce educational barriers while maximizing benefits to all students, not just those with disabilities. This approach provides students with multiple means of acquiring information, giving them ways to demonstrate what they have learned, and various opportunities to engage with the material. So using those three, three concepts I highlighted in the last slide, we can break it down a little bit further. You can think of acquiring as the what of learning. You as the instructor present information in multiple ways, such as providing a video lecture with closed captioning, as well as a text-based transcript of that lecture. This allows students different avenues to access the content. You can think of demonstrating as the how of learning. Students are given multiple opportunities to demonstrate what they have learned, meaning you may give students assignment options and they pick one that speaks to their interests and skills. For instance, you could assign students a paper or allow them to create a podcast demonstrating the course or assignment objectives. An engagement is the why of learning. It's important to find multiple ways for students to engage with the course content, their fellow students, and you as the instructor to make the material more meaningful. Some examples of this could be creating pair and group assignments, dividing overarching course goals into smaller short-term objectives, or asking students to reflect on how this course connects to their personal learning goals. And when executed properly, these three concepts of acquiring, demonstrating, and engagement come together to help create motivated, empowered learners who are strategic about their goals. So what does UDL look like in the context of a library? Well, you may already be doing these things in your sessions or classes by mixing and matching engagement activities, such as you have a tutorial, maybe you have a handout, you have some think pair share activities and many more. And, and that helps appeal to the widest audience as possible. Um, many of you may teach one shot sessions, which are required to be tied to a specific assignment. So this provides motivation and context to what and why they are learning. 
And if you don't already, think about sharing your slides, notes, and any handouts with the class or the instructor after you wrap up so students can refer to the material well after leaving the library. And especially now that many of us are completely online, you have the opportunity to think about what you want UDL to look like in your library for the next quarter or semester and beyond. It may need to quickly evolve since we don't have a lot of time to plan. It's most likely gonna be trial by fire, but just take a few minutes to see what other libraries are doing to get ideas. There's no need to reinvent the wheel when, you're all, when we're all struggling to keep up. So why UDL? Um, as you can guess, UDL can help you and your institution meet federal and state legal mandates as outlined in the Americans with Disability Act and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. These laws help ensure students have equal access and helps your institution avoid legal troubles. As I previously mentioned, implementing UDL benefits different types of learners, not just those with disabilities. This approach can help English language learners, those with different learning styles like visual or auditory learners, and even those who have trouble con concentrating and need multiple methods of absorbing course content. Um, an example I see all the time is if a student is riding the bus and they're watching your lecture, having closed, con uh, closed captioning can help that student absorb the material easier. Um, this helps to promote a more inclusive learning environment by letting students know you're thinking of ways to help them succeed by offering various inroads to the material. And UDL also helps to reduce stigma by preemptively providing options without forcing students to make a request for alternative content formats. Uh, here are a few tips to keep in mind. It's easy to feel overwhelmed when you start thinking about how much work goes into creating and retrofitting your course content. It can certainly feel like there's no end. Um, it's not about perfection, it's about progress. Once you create a few accessible versions of your resources, try to reuse them as often as possible. At the very least, you won't necessarily have to make new versions every time you teach. And while my portion of the presentation focuses on using technology, UDL can be low tech, such as a simple announcement to draw attention to a particular resource or module, um, as I mentioned, providing assignment options for different types of learners, or providing downloadable lectures, uh, lecture notes or slides highlighting the main ideas. And whenever possible, start with creating accessible versions of your new content. That way you can plan what you want and how you want it to look from the start. Then you can go back and retrofit your older content with accessibility in mind as needed. So the next few slides I'm gonna highlight free and low cost tools you can start using right away to make your course content more accessible. Um, Otranscribe is a web app that lets users upload an audio or video file or enter a link to a YouTube video for a transcription within the same page. You can pause, rewind, and fast forward without taking your hands off the keyboard. You can export the transcript to Markdown, plain text, or Google Docs. So rather than having an audio or video player up or you know, the YouTube web page up, along with a Word doc, you can play the file and transcribe in one place. Whoops. Uh, Wave is a tool that allows you to check the accessibility of a specific web page. You can use Wave, Wave site to check, or you can install a Firefox or Chrome extension. This tool is great for instructors who host content outside of their institution's learning management system. And a word of warning, you can only check one page at a time, so it can be time consuming. Amara is a free web app that allows users to create or improve upon a video's captions or subtitles. After you create the captions for your video, you can export them as a text file. Um, you, can you also have the option to pay for captioning or translation services if your budget allows. You Describe is a project of the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute, and it's a free web-based platform that allows you to add audio descriptions of the actions taking place within YouTube videos. You can search and browse for previously completed videos, create a wish list for others to help you um, add those uh, descriptions. And the site also offers step-by-step -step instructions for adding your own descriptions if you have the time. And just to clarify, um, Amara is for subtitles or closed captioning of dialogue, and you describe is for narrating what is happening in each scene. So for instance, the video is a, a man walking up to an elevator. It describes the man walking up 
you know, what he's wearing and him pushing the button. So it's not actually what the man is saying, it's what the man is doing. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with Blackboard Ally, which is a very robust tool that is compatible with multiple learning management systems like Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, and Brightspace. It automatically checks your uploaded content for accessibility issues and provides suggestions to make improvements, such as letting you know an image doesn't have alternative text or if a file doesn't have the proper headings. It also automatically creates alternative versions of your content, such as electronic Braille or MP3 files. If you don't have access to Panopto or VoiceThread, you may want to consider Screencast-O-Matic. This is a video platform that allows you to record your screen and webcam for tutorials and lessons. You can record up to 15 minutes at a time for free, but to access editing and hosting upgrades, the site charges a nominal fee of in the roughly two to four dollar a month range, um, depending on the level for personal plans. And they also offer group plans for anywhere from 10 to 500 plus people. And don't forget about the accessibility features built into Google and its subsidiary YouTube. As you've noticed, Google Slides offers free real-time closed captioning, which we're using right now. It's not perfect, but it works pretty darn well. Um, this would be a great tool for synchronous lectures or demonstrations. Google also offers voice to text and accessibility settings that allow you to turn on screen reader and screen magnifier support. Uh, I just learned about a neat feature for Google Drive when preparing this presentation. If you have a video, <clears throat> excuse me, saved in your Google Drive that needs closed captioning, you can upload a file with the closed captioning text, add it to your video, amend your video, and even auto translate the closed captioning to a different language. If you are uploading videos to YouTube, you can have YouTube automatically generate closed captioning and you can edit those captions. From there, you can extract a transcript. Since my campus has a deal with Microsoft, I haven't begun to fully explore all that can be done with Google, so that's on my ever-growing to-do list. Here are some suggested resources for you to continue to explore the world of accessibility beyond this webinar. ACRL has a universal accessibility interest group you can join, and um, there's an archive that goes back um, more than 10 years. You can see what other people have been talking about in the past. And members share resources and provide feedback about tools and best practices. The University of Washington has a great page that provides directions for creating accessible documents and videos, as well as tips for designing accessible online courses. WebAIM offers a collection of articles focused on web accessibility and user perspectives, legal standards, and more. There's dozens to look through. There's a lot of information there. Um, here's some additional considerations you might want to make for future planning. Reach out to your disability support office. It's great to have that relationship, which can provide you insight into student needs and trends you may not necessarily be aware of in your library. They may also have suggestions for tools or vendors you can use to make your content more accessible. Uh, for the second point, seek out training when you can. If you're like me, you now have professional development funds that cannot be used for travel. Ask if you can apply these funds to accessibility focused webinars or classes. If your campus has an accessibility committee, see if library personnel can join. My institution has a committee called Accessibility and Disability Action Planning Team, or ADAPT for short, and it's made, of, made up of folks from HR, IT, Veterans Affairs, Public Affairs, Facilities, there's faculty and staff from various colleges and departments, and we have two student representatives. And I've been a member since fall 2019 and it's been wonderful. Right now we're working on a proposed job description for hiring a campus IT accessibility coordinator, which is much needed, particularly at this time with fully online instruction. We've also brainstormed ideas to get more instructors on board with creating accessible content, such as offering badges or certificates after undergoing certain training, uh, regularly sharing accessibility tips in our daily campus announcement email that goes out to all faculty and staff, and holding paid focus groups with students with disabilities to get direct feedback about what is and what isn't working on campus. So in summary, Treat UDL, Universal Design for Learning, as a holistic design approach, not just something you do occasionally. It takes some getting used to, but once you start thinking about how to approach your content to meet the needs of the most students as possible, it becomes second nature. 
Um, number two, focus on creating accessible versions of new content and then work on older content when you have little pockets of time. And finally, give yourself time to try some of these tools in the coming weeks and months. And once you get comfortable with a few of these tools, think about sharing what you've learned with your coworkers. The more people who learn and implement UDL practices, the better off our students will be. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel, who's gonna talk about creating accessible documents and PDFs. Okay. So we put that quote up as our transition slide, just always a good reminder. Uh, you can only do what you can do. There we go. So I'm going to start with tips for creating documents. My primary word processors are Microsoft Word and Google Docs, so I will focus on those, but whatever you use, you can look for these features. So your first best practice and future habit is headings. Use the headings built into Microsoft Word, Google Docs, or whatever software you're using. You'll see it at the top, normal text, heading one, heading two, etc. If you don't like the way the heading looks, for whatever reason, you can change it, but use the designated style type. This does some wonderful things. For everyone, it creates a structure that makes your document easier to navigate, and it creates a consistent look and expectation for the organization of the information in the document. Those heading levels are an important component of that. For people with screen readers, it really makes your document easier to navigate. They can use the headings to navigate to the section they want rather than work through the entire text. Think about the difference in your life from when you went from a cassette player where you had to keep pressing forward and rewind until you found what you wanted to having a CD player where you can skip right to that song. You remove a barrier. The heading levels also make it easier to filter to only what they need in that moment. For you, this also allows you to create a table of contents automatically generated by the computer that you can quickly update when you edit the document. So this is an example from a Google Doc showing the headings making your document easier to navigate. The automatically created table of contents are the links on the right side above the text of the document and the document outline on the left showing that the cursor is on the top heading Google Docs. You can see and navigate to any section like the table of contents but the document outline on the left I can see and interact with no matter where I am in the document which is especially helpful for when there's many many pages. Microsoft Word will do the same thing with the headings in Word, you can use control click to navigate to the section from the table of contents. And the sidebar for the document outline is the same because the document has created an underlying structure to the text. Another thing is lists. And at this point, I'm going to make a statement that you should use the software's integrated format options whenever possible. For example, with lists, don't create your own form of a list with an indentation that is not actually a bulleted or numbered list, but kind of looks like one. These pre-formatted options don't just affect the look of the document, but it inserts a tag that cues the screen reader that this is a list, this is the start of a list, these are the list items, and this is the end of the list. If you want space between your list items, adjust the line spacing or use the add space after paragraph option. If you use enter, that is put a blank line between each item of a three item list, the computer will tag that as three separate lists, which will confuse whoever is using a screen reader. If 
for your font, it should be a 12 point font or larger. There is no one magical font that you should be using, but the consensus is to keep it simple. It should be native to the computer, not a fancy one that you've downloaded. There are recommendations for sans serif fonts like Veranda or Arial, especially for on-screen viewing. These are the blockier texts without ornamentation. The serif fonts like Times New Roman and Georgia have variations in thickness and have some flares on the ends. The image under fonts is the same word in the same size in 12 different fonts. The first column are the sans serif fonts. You can compare that to the second column of serif fonts. The third column is the fonts that are like handwriting and cursive. There is not extra space between them. That space is part of the font. So you can see in addition to the way the letters are formed, the font includes the spacing between the letters and between the rows. Open Dyslexic to the right is a sample of a typeface that you can download for free from that site. It was designed to make reading easier for people with common symptoms of dyslexia. You might love that font, you might hate it, but it's an example that you can't accommodate for everyone's needs using one method. But there are also tools and resources out there to help accommodate people's needs. Whichever font you choose, just, decide, just remember to keep it simple. Avoid cursive or fancy fonts, and don't use more than two or three fonts in one document. Also, white space is your friend. No one likes reading a single spaced document. It should be about 1.2 line spacing or more. When you're thinking about color, use high contrast. You can't go wrong with black text on a white background. If a user that, if as a user that doesn't work for me, I can tell my computer to invert the colors. You cannot control for all needs at once, but that high contrast makes it easy to read and to adjust if needed. There are tools to check your contrast, like WebAIM and ColorSafe you can see on the slide. Color alone should not convey meaning. On the slide, the two links to the uh, contrast checkers are in different colors. Can you see those colors? Do those different colors mean something? Is one better than the other? In this case, no. But if I can't see the colors, how would I know? How would I know to ask that question? Color used to convey meaning creates a barrier for students who cannot see, who cannot see well, and those with color blindness. The most common form of color blindness is for red green, but it's not the only form, so you can't just avoid those colors. Note, I'm not saying never use color. I'm not saying you must exist in grayscale. Color can be decorative. You can also use color to reinforce a meaning, but use text to convey the meaning. If something is important, don't just put the sentence in red. Before the sentence write, important. Another best practice is to use alternative text. This is for images, word art, anything not text. The computer, a screen reader, can't describe an image. Your alt text is added to cue the user to what is the content of the image. So your future habit, if it's not already, when you add an image, right click on the image and select edit alt text. You don't need to add image of to the description. A screen reader will already tell the user that it's an image. If it's important that the user know it is an illustration or a portrait, then do add that in the alt text. The alt text should be short, a sentence. It should describe what the image is in the context of how it is being used without being a direct copy of the text around it. This can be a difficult thing to craft, especially if you're not used to it. One strategy I've heard is to think about describing the image to someone over the phone. If an image is just decorative, it does not convey meaning or important information, Microsoft Word lets you mark it as decorative and the screener will, screen reader will basically ignore it. For links, 
make the text of the hyperlink descriptive to what it is linking to. If you do the description and then have the click here as the actual link, that can make it difficult. Screen readers can give a list of links, but that's not helpful if the text for every link is click here. You can see the two links on the slide. What page will open for the click here link? What page will open for the ACRL Presents Webcasts link? They're both the same length, just presented differently. One is descriptive. I'm not going to, I'm going to take a moment to remind everyone the value of providing descriptive file names for documents as well. You and your coworkers, students, faculty, users, and everyone else should know what they will get without having to open the document. So to summarize, be descriptive, be clear, be concise. There are some features that can help you. For example, in Microsoft Word, there's a check accessibility. The fastest way to get to it is on the review tab. This checks the document and opens a side panel to identify points to improve to make the document more accessible. You can do it at the end of your document or you can do it at the beginning and leave the side tab open to give you feedback in real time as you edit the document. Google Docs does not have this feature, but you can install an add-in to check accessibility. I haven't used it, but I've heard of Crackle. Uh, it is a service that you pay to use. There is also text-to-speech. This will have the computer read the text to you. I find this especially valuable when I have hours of staring at the computer and I just need to give my eyes a break. It is built into Microsoft Word. You can see it on the review tab to the, left of, to the left of check accessibility. You can also add it to your quick access toolbar. It will read the text from where the cursor is to the end of the document or just a highlighted selection of text. It is not a screen reader. It will not announce images and alt text, but I found it helpful. If you have a Mac, you can turn on the text-to-speech option in the system preferences under dictation and speech. You can then highlight text on a document, web page, or accessible P PDF to have the computer read it to you with a keyboard command. Accessibility tools are more frequently available and you should investigate what your computer has. So next we'll look at creating PDFs. One of the ways to do this is from a document you've created. So Microsoft Office, Adobe InDesign, LibreOffice, and OpenOffice keep their accessible, accessibility information when Save As or Export To PDF are used. So if you have done, used your good habits to create an accessible document, you will have an accessible PDF. Yay! However, don't choose print to PDF. A screen reader may still be able to access the text of the PDF created in this way, but the heading structure, alternative text, and any other tag structures will be lost. If you are scanning some basic readability, don't cut off part of the page. Don't have large dark spots that make the text unreadable. Do scan in black and white or 24-bit color, depending on the content of what you're scanning. Do use high contrast and do scan one print page as one electronic page. For the resolution, Scan text-based documents with at least a 300 dpi dots per inch. A higher resolution, like 600 dpi, may be required for image-heavy content. This makes it easier for people to view and read and makes it easier for conversion software to identify characters. A scan of a page is a picture of text and therefore inaccessible in many ways. It is important to have a scanner or system 
that has optical character recognition, or OCR. This turns the image of the text into a computer readable text. Often, this is identified as saving a document as a searchable PDF. If you can highlight and copy text, if you can use Control F to search the PDF for a word, that's because of OCR. Without this, the scan is just an image, and as we know, the computer can't describe an image. The scan is inaccessible to anyone with a screen reader. It is also frustrating to anyone who wants to copy or search in the document. If the scanner does not have OCR, there is software like Adobe Acrobat Pro that can recognize text and save that information to the file. To make a PDF fully accessible, you would tag the images with alt text, but just using OCR is great. So to review, our new habits, we're going to use headings and use the designated styles. You can change the formatting if you don't like the way it looks. We're going to use the bulleted numbered or unnumbered lists. For our font, we're going to keep it simple. Color, we're going to use high contrast and we're going to use it to reinforce a concept but not to convey meaning. Alternative text, we're going to add to every image and create a simple, clear description. Links, we're going to make the displayed text of the links descriptive so the user knows where they're going to go when they click on it. You can use accessibility checkers uh, like the one available in Microsoft Office um, to identify ways to improve our document. You can use the text to speech. Your, do your computer will read the document to you, but keep in mind it's not a screen reader. Saving a Word document to PDF, use Save As or Export to PDF to retain the great work you've done to make it accessible. Scan for readability. Set up the scanner and the page to get a clear image. Use a resolution that's 300 DPI or higher, especially if you have a lot of images on the page. An optical character recognition, or OCR, takes an image to text. The We're going to take a moment to acknowledge our references and thank them for, for sharing their knowledge and information with us that we can share it with you. And thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, you might not be hearing this enough right now, but you are doing a great job. Who could have predicted at the beginning of the year that we would be in this situation? We appreciate everything you are doing to serve your communities and taking time to be here with us to learn more about accessibility so you can continue to serve your communities as best as you can. And at this time, we'll open up the floor for questions and other suggestions people may have had. Great, thanks Lauren and Rachel. And I encourage people to add more questions to the chat box, but um, we did have a couple come in throughout the presentation that I'll just start um, reading off. Um, so we had a question asking, um, for alt text of things like memes, should you include the full text even if it's more than one sentence? I would. Um because the, otherwise the joke is lost. Um, I've done that when I shared social media posts that um, in March, you know, Women's History Month, I, I, every Wednesday I posted quotes from inspiring women and I, they were images with the quote and a photo of the woman who, who provided that quote. And so what I did was in the alt, text I put the quote in there even if it was you know two sentences obviously I pick shorter ones so I would do the same with memes if you can try and mm, 
compact it down to as short as possible. Like woman yelling at a cat saying this, you know, whatever that is, you know, whatever the, the meme is. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, for creating alt text, one of the things is not to just reiterate what's in the text around the image, but if there's image in the text that you need to know to understand the image and why it's being used, then it would be good to add that in. Uh, the keeping it to one sense is a rule of thumb. It's not, it's a guideline, not a rule. Yeah, exactly. Laura, Great, would you be able you. to um, share your oh. screen again so we can keep getting the closed captioning? Yeah. And that's a great segue to a question that came in um, that was asking, how are we captioning the presentation? Is that a special software? So this, the closed captioning is just, I don't know if you can see when I move my mouse, the menu bar that appears. I'm not sure if you guys, everyone can see that, but there you can. It, you can? Okay. So right here, it just says captions and we pick that, you just select it and it starts immediately um, doing closed captioning. So it was not any, any involved process. We just click it and it goes. And like I mentioned earlier, it's not perfect, but I'm really impressed with how accurate it is. Yeah, Zoom does not have a free real-time closed captioning. They will give you a transcript at the end if you select that feature. Um, the kind of magic sauce that we found is well, everything you're seeing is from Lauren's computer. So she doesn't have a headset on, putting the sound into her ear. Her computer is hearing me through her speakers mm -hmm. and adding that into the Google Presents captioning. Google Presents, I don't think, creates a transcript, but if you record it, it'll be part of the recording. Mm -hmm. Thank you, because I can't see the questions now that I have my screen <laughs> expanded, so. Yeah, and I really appreciate you guys sharing that. We tried captioning the same way for an ACRL Presents webcast the other week, and didn't we all of our presenters were on headsets, so we did not have the success that you guys did today. So thank you so much for sharing this with us for our future events. Yeah, very helpful. Um, another question that came in was um, for headings, do the numbers refer to which actual heading it is within the document or just a relation to the size? For example, is it okay to use heading four when it is the only heading in the document? The number refers to the level. So if I'm a user and I get to heading four, I'm wondering where's heading one, two, and three was something deleted. So as I mentioned, if you, if you prefer the look of heading four to heading one, then go ahead and change heading one to look more like heading four um, as it appears in the document. Uh, but it creates an organization that underlies the document. So you starting with heading one, and then a sub um, a subgroup would be heading two, and then a subgroup of that would be heading three, and then coming back again to your main points always being heading one. Thanks. Um, another question from the group. Um, if you save a regular PDF to PDF A, does that change the accessibility? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't seen anything uh, saying um, that it would affect it. So I think um, using the, the PDF A still keeps all of that underlying structure in there as far as I know. Yeah, I don't think it strips out any of the behind the scenes accessibility tags that you put in. 
Thank you. Um, are there any principles to keep in mind when you are filming a video to make it accessible outside of creating subtitle files? Um, besides just aesthetics, like making sure it's clear, making sure it's light enough that you can see the, you know, if you are presenting yourself or another, um, you know, you're sharing a concept or whatnot. Um, I would say even if you go off script, have a transcript, or if you're using slides, keep those slides as a separate download or keep that transcript of your lecture or, or you know, presentation, whatever it is, separate. So people can, again, they can watch it, they can listen to it, you know, as an MP3, if you have um, Ally, if you're uploading to your LMS and you have Blackboard Ally, it automatically will let students download it as an MP3. That's not something you have to do differently, but you need to upload your transcript of your, your text, uh, of your presentation. Um, if you don't and you're just kind of winging it, make a few slides with the general points, just what you want students or um, attendees to walk away with, the main points. That's what I would recommend. Thanks so much. Um, another question, how did you create the table of contents in Google Docs? So as I was creating the document, I was using the headings uh, to, with my, my main points and to create the sections. And then I put my cursor at the top of the page, which is important because wherever your cursor is, is where the table of contents will be inserted. So I put it at the top of the page and then I went to insert and then all the way down at the bottom under insert is table of contents and there's two formatting options. One is links, one is uh, page numbers and then it will just automatically insert um, into your document and then if you have to add other sections then later there's a circular arrow that'll be to the left just clicking on that and the computer will automatically update to include those new sections, or even if the page numbers changed, it'll update those as well. Thanks. I think I caught all of the questions that have come in through the chat so far, um, but if I missed your question, please fill it in, share it in the chat, or if others have new questions that have popped up, um, please add them. And can we send you our slides because we have links embedded in them. I don't know if that can be shared as well to attendees. I don't know if that's a possibility. Yes, absolutely. If you can just um, send them over to me, I'll make sure we share those out when we send out the link to the recording. Oh, perfect. I see a, a, another new question that has popped up. What sort of alt text do you recommend for an image that is purely decorative if there isn't a decorative tag option? It depends on what you're adding the decorative text to. Uh, there are kind of like empty texts and for some things it's just putting a space in there and for others it's just putting uh, like two quotes around nothing so if you're in Microsoft Word then hitting the decorative box creates that for you and it's great I haven't been able to find in Google Docs how to create an empty like an empty description for them so you could even, if you're not sure, you could even just put something like decorative or mm -hmm. like border design, just so that they know it they're wasn't. not missing something. Yeah. yeah. It's a picture of my cat, <laughs> just, just for fun. <laughs> um, a somewhat related question is how do you deal with alt text on something like Instagram? Um, for me, I actually manage the social media for my, my library 
and I need to get better about it, but what I should be doing, which I admit I haven't been doing it enough of, just I put my caption for the photo, you know, like we had a great time at pizza night and then do um, return, do a couple returns and then in brackets put image of, you know, a young man grabbing a slice of pizza that just describes the image within the caption. So it's pretty simple. I will admit I don't have Instagram. <laughs> You're rare. You're very rare. And I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question asking, is there an accessible way to do hashtags? Like in a social media post? say the okay, only I'm thing thinking. I know is to make sure you capitalize new words mm -hmm. rather than having it all be a string of lowercase make sure each word has starts with a capital even though they're all together yeah that sounds that's that's what I would do and it's it's just easier for me to make sure I didn't misspell something that way too Are there any additional questions or questions that we missed? Happy to make sure we get everything answered. Great. Well, I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. So I um, would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Really thank Lauren and Rachel for your time, for putting this together, especially so quickly. Um, look forward to sharing the resources out for everyone. We'll email it um, and also make it available on the ACRL website and YouTube channel. So please look there. Um, and thanks again for joining us, everyone. Yes, thank you Have so much. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Happy Friday. Yes. Happy Friday. <laughs>